It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to today's uh, lunchtime lecture. I'm Nathan Hill, I'm director of the Trinity Center for Asian Studies. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, today's speaker, who's Professor uh, James Leibold, uh, the head of department of politics, media, and philosophy at La Trobe University in Melbourne. Uh, and he's, uh, he's also a uh, senior fellow at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And I think uh, one can say one of the world experts in uh, Chinese nationalities uh, policy. And he'll uh, be giving us this talk, Taming Mongolia, Xi Jinping's agenda for coercive nation building in the inner Mongolian autonomous region. Thanks uh, very much, um, Nathan. Thanks for the invitation and for the uh, Trinity Center for Asian Studies for hosting uh, my talk. Uh, so this um, talk is really based on some new research uh, that I've uh, conducted, uh, looking at the implementation of uh, Minzu policies in the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region, um, and really builds on, I guess, over two decades of work trying to track uh, changes in uh, Minzu uh, theory, Minzu policy uh, debates. Uh, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm new to uh, Inner Mongolia. I don't speak Mongolian. Uh, lucky enough to travel there a couple of times uh, when I was living in China. But um, I'm on a kind of steep uh, learning curve here. But what I'm trying to do is uh, apply some of the the the, the previous uh, findings uh, that um, I've been able to gain looking at um, policy debates as well as. Some of the more recent work I've been doing, looking at um, policy implementation in Xinjiang to uh, Inner Mongolia, and, and part of my aim here is to, to to widen out our perspective and to look at the way in which um, what, what's happening in, in China in terms of this kind of this limited uh, turn is, is occurring at different paces and, and in different ways in different uh, parts of China. So. Um, this is based on an article that's um, forthcoming in the China Leadership Monitor. Um, I'm going to try to speak for 30 to 40 minutes, uh, um, try, try to aim for 30 minutes, uh, so we can have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion. Um, and, and I really want to kind of start with a kind of wider lens of looking at recent changes in ethnic policy before I kind of turn to uh, the situation in Inner Mongolia. Now, um, language, as um, I'm sure we all know, and I know uh, Nathan knows very well, is, is really all about power. Um, and in my research, I've tried to really uh, offer a close reading of Chinese language discourse on Minzu, uh, a, a term that is um, deeply uh, polysolemic and highly contested. And in fact, I would argue you could chart the kind of evolution of Chinese thinking on ethnic policies and theory in the PRC by looking at the altering glosses in English for this term Minzu. Um, for much of its history, um, Minzu was uh, translated as nationality, uh, really giving a nod to the idea that China was a multi-nation state with 56 officially recognized nations. Uh, yet these nations, um, of course, were never equal in terms of size and power. Uh, marking, uh, our, uh, marking one of the fundamental tensions in China's approach for managing its ethnic diversity. It's got a, uh, what, what uh, my colleague Tom Mullaney called a kind of odd calculus of uh, 55 uh, minorities plus one supermajority somehow comprises one nation state. And that's really the key challenge that, uh, uh, that Chinese policy members has been dealing with. And of course, that one supermajority, the Han, has always uh, functioned as the kind of core, the normative core, uh, the, the standard uh, for the nation, a kind of seemingly uh, unmarked signifier of modernity and Chineseness. Yet until recently, um, you know, the, the so-called uh, Minzu Wenti or the, the, the Minzu question or problem was really viewed as a kind of long-term one uh, with gradual, uh, uneven, uh, pace of development viewed as a kind of key to its uh, solution. Um, China was seeking uh, unity uh, through diversity uh, with the, uh, the, the original emphasis really on this uh, idea of diversity as a part of uh, Fei Xiaotong's uh, 1988 in idiom 
uh, of the Chinese nation's Duoyuan Iti Gaju, or the structure of unity and diversity. Uh, in order to safeguard this uh, process of autonomous development, the party state adopted a range of policies in the 1950s that were then institutionalized in the 1980s. And, and these policies really, by international standards, were incredibly progressive. Uh, they were the uh, formal recognition of uh, minority um, languages, <laughs> cultures, and religious practices, their constitutional protection uh, for equal status, uh, to a system of regional ethnic autonomy uh, that, uh, at least on paper, promised to allow uh, minority nationalities like the Mongols to be masters of their own home. And then third, a range of uh, preferential policies, think of them as affirmative action policies to protect and support minority nationalities with their autonomous development. Um, it was believed that by assisting with this development uh, 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 of minority nationalities, uh, of course, each according to their own pace and traditions, that China would slowly but surely move towards a, a collective a sense of unity, that national differences would uh, disappear in the wake of uh, class uh, solidarity and kind of traditional Marxist uh, thought. But of course, you know, as, as, um, as China grew more powerful under Deng Xiaoping in its uh, external environment altered, so too do its uh, Minzu policies, <laughs> or what is um, now glossed as um, uh, uh, its ethnic policies with Minzu now rendered in English as ethnicity. Following the collapse of the USSR in, in, in 91, a range of really influential scholar officials um, uh, such as Beidaz, uh, Ma Rong, uh, the United Front Work Department's uh, Ju Wei Chun, as well as Tsinghua University's um, Huang Gang, uh, began to call for like an urgent rethink of China's uh, Minzu policies in order to forestall what they believed would be a inevitable collapse of China along its ethnic seams like the USSR or Yugoslavia. They argued that current uh, policies place too much emphasis uh, on uh, Minzu differences and peculiarities, and not enough on a, a, a shared uh, belonging culture and identity. Without um, urgent nation uh, building, they argued China's uh, uh, national and regime security uh, was under threat. Uh, uh, Huang Gang and Julian He put forward this idea of a second generation of ethnic policies, uh, one that would uh, remove uh, administrative and institutional barriers to national cohesion uh, and permit uh, inter-ethnic uh, as well as inter-regional uh, mobility and mingling. Uh, 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 the, the party state also believed that it was important to kind of scale back and ultimately eliminate uh, Minzu-based preferential policies, as it was argued that these helped to strengthen uh, ethnic uh, attachments. Uh, some uh, even went uh, so far to call for the entire elimination of the system of regional ethnic autonomy, uh, which would require the revision of the constitution and maybe even the, the repeal of the 1984 law on regional ethnic autonomy. Um, of course, ethnic, uh, in their view of, of a new generation of ethnic policies, uh, uh, ethnic identities weren't to be removed completely. Uh, rather, you know, colorful costumes and songs uh, like we see here in the children walking across the Burdness Stadium in 2008 uh, could remain, but the focus really needed to be uh, on a, a single shared uh, guozu. And this is a term that uh, uh, Huang Gang uh, and Julian He uh, 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 turned back to. Uh, a, a concept that was first coined uh, by Liang Qichao and then used quite, uh, quite frequently by Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and this idea of a guozu, uh, I've kind of rendered in uh, English in the past as a kind of state race, because I do think it has a, has a, a, a racial eugenics uh, element uh, to it. Uh, the goal here was uh, to achieve um, unity from diversity, uh, as Professor uh, Xiong Kong Xin uh, argued when he inverted Fei Xiaotong's formulation uh, uh, to uh, ET Duoyuan, 
uh, arguing that unity is foundational and diversity is derivative in, in a recent um, article. So against that backdrop, um, you know, enter uh, Xi Jinping stage right in 2012. Uh, now, like uh, most policy areas, uh, Xi really sought to put his own stamp on the Minzu problem. Um, and I've written about this in the past. He doesn't really come to the job with a lot of experience uh, dealing with this issue. Uh, be interesting to know how, who he turned to as an advisor, uh, you know, uh, Wang Huning uh, clearly plays a role, but I also feel that uh, people like uh, Ju Wei Chun uh, also had the ear uh, of Xi Jinping. And so he clearly borrows quite heavily from those advocating a second generation of ethnic policies. But what we see is there's not a complete match, a one-to-one. -one. Uh, and in fact, he sought to kind of take ethnic policies in a slightly new direction, a, a real return uh, to Mao uh, and an emphasis uh, on the importance of ideology, education, and culture. Uh, you know, the, the, the superstructure uh, rather than base was going to ultimately solve uh, the, uh, the Minzu Wenti. Um, his uh, self-declared new era required the uh, adjustment uh, of uh, Minzu work. Uh, one needed to realize that economic development alone uh, would not solve the, the, the Minzu question, but rather it required a, a focus on cultural in, in, in spiritual work. Um, in 2019, she uh, stated that cultural identity is the soul of the nation, uh, the root uh, of national unity. Uh, th his concept of uh, forging the collective consciousness of the Zhonghua Minzu has been declared the kind of main line of uh, Xi, Xi Jinping theory on uh, nation building work in the new era. And this concept of uh, 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 forging collective consciousness, the key, the key verb here really is this concept of zhu lao, uh, which literally means to forge or to smelt, suggesting that the party state needed to adopt a really interventionist approach to building collective identity in the PRC. Uh, and as a result, education and ideological work were really deemed the kind of main battlefield in the drive for cultural security requiring party officials and educators to, in, in Xi's word, plant the seed of patriotism in uh, the souls of every Chinese citizens from infancy uh, and ensuring uh, language again, being very important that uh, Putonghua medium education was universalized as was uh, patriotic education throughout the entire uh, country. It also required the promotion of um, inter-ethnic mingling and mobility uh, a desire to really break down these autonomous regions. Uh, it, they could remain in name only. In fact, one of the, one of the things that she did was to, to, to state that the system of regional ethnic autonomy was, uh, was a foundational uh, principle of, uh, of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. It would stay, but it would stay largely in name only. And what was required was to, you know, the through kind of transmigration of Han into the frontier and the movement of uh, minorities out of these regions, you would break down uh, the, the, the attachment that minority groups had with these regions uh, and essentially render autonomy hollow. Um, uh, the term Duo uh, UNET, this uh, Fei Xiao Tong term, is actually still used by Xi and, and party officials. It's incredibly uh, a resilient and a robust uh, concept, uh, but now is probably best translated as, um, and I've been playing with this, uh, multiple uh, beginnings, single essence, or even out of many one, which uh, is actually the same rendering of the Latin term e pluribus unum, uh, which is inscribed on the great seal of the United States. And in fact, uh, much like the kind of China dream, uh, one could argue this uh, rendering of uh, Duo Yuan ET is, uh, was clearly drawn upon the American model and a kind of idealized view of the American uh, melting uh, pot. So with that as a bit of background, uh, what I wanted to do in kind of uh, looking at the Inner Mongolia was just to use it as another example to look at the way in which these, uh, this new policy agenda uh, was being implemented in um, in Inner, Mon uh, Inner Mongolia. 
Um, now, uh, Inner Mongolia is not, um, it's not, uh, Xinjiang is not Tibet. Uh, and that was my kind of starting, uh, starting points. And as I said before, I'm, uh, I'm still on a learning curve here to understand, but clearly um, uh, Inner Mongolia had a stronger uh, level of autonomy uh, than uh, the other two regions. Uh, clearly it was a, an area of concern for Xi Jinping. It was the first uh, ethnic minor minority region he's visited. It's the only one he's visited twice. Um, he's met numerous times with the Inner Mongolian delegation at the MPC. Um, and and this, this concept of Inner Mongolia being a kind of model autonomous region was something first coined by uh, Joanne Lai back in the 1950s. Um, and, and it was sort of seen as a badge of honor. You know, the, the Mongols were the first to kind of join uh, the PRC, but it's also been used uh, often uh, to castigate the region and Mongolian officials when uh, they uh, are, are believed or uh, perceived to have failed to live up to this lofty uh, title. And that's certainly what happened um, in 2020, August and September, when a educational protest movement broke out. <coughs> um, and uh, we can see the, the party state, the, the system, the, the central party in particular, uh, coming down quite hard on Mongolian officials for uh, not falling in line. Um, so the, without going into detail, I think some of you are uh, aware of what prompted the, uh, the language uh, protests. The party state tried to ram through a series of really highly contentious changes to the medium instructions, as well as textbooks in the region's Mongolian schools. And as a result, uh, parents took to the streets and students led a uh, school boycott that really captured the attention of the international media. So in my um, forthcoming article, what I sought to try to understand is what really happened after uh, the gaze of the international community turned elsewhere. Uh, so I, I really wanted to kind of understand um, not what happened during the protest movement, but what happened afterwards. Um, and uh, unpack what um, I uh, argued is a, a kind of toolkit of control and transformation that Xi Jinping at the party center used to uh, tame uh, Inner Mongolia. And so in the article, I look at kind of four features in particular, and I'll just go through each of them uh, briefly. The first one is um, often the kind of knee-jerk response of the party state system when there's any a form of instability that is to, you know, uh, to, 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 to bring uh, society uh, uh, under control. Um, and uh, under Xi Jinping, we've seen uh, the party, uh, party's mechanisms of control uh, really strengthened uh, with new innovations of both human and automated forms of surveillance and control and real strengthening of the party at the grassroots. And, that investment uh, pays dividends when you have unrest like you had in, in 2020. Uh, and um, um, what, what we saw is that where possible, uh, authorities first sought to, uh, to incentivize compliance. You know, there are a number of cases of uh, them offering carrots um, for students to bring back fellow classmates into school. But when these carrots uh, failed, the party state quickly turned to the stick. Uh, in Tongliao City, uh, which is home to uh, over 100 Mongolian medium schools, with nearly half of the city's population being ethnically Mongolian, uh, the police started uh, posting S uh, CCTV uh, photos on their Weixing account, uh, calling on residents to daub in their fellow citizens for picking quarrels and provoking trouble. Um, I, I was um, really quite gobsmacked when I found that uh, these, uh, these posts are still up uh, on Weixin uh, and haven't been taken down. And I mean, this is a series of um, uh, surveillance footage of people uh, that, um, you know, looking for other civilians to sort of daub them in. As um, opposition uh, continued to linger, the authorities turned to more uh, blunt tactics, including uh, the expulsion of students and the dismissal of their parents from state uh, employment, uh, the imposition of mandatory legal training, blacklisting, severing of social benefits, uh, and even detention and formal arrest uh, should all other 
efforts uh, fail. And unsurprisingly, uh, within two months, um, students were back in school, order was restored, and uh, then the re-education campaign began. And that's uh, uh, the more interesting part uh, for, for, for myself, is sort of how do you, how, how do you elicit kind of slow uh, change uh, 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 and rewire uh, a society and this population uh, over the long term? Um, so in, in the immediate wake of the, uh, the protests, you had both regional and central party officials like Shi Taifeng and uh, Wang Yang uh, castigating local officials and talking about deep-seated problems in ethnic work and calling for a kind of urgent rectification campaign. Um, and sure enough, in, in December, um, the, uh, the new head of the Education Bureau, uh, Huang Yali, uh, launched a new ideological campaign around Xi Jinping's pet phrase of forging a collective consciousness of the Zhonghua uh, Minzu. Uh, and throughout um, 2021, I used a lot of Weixin uh, posts to, 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 to track this. Uh, you could see that staff and students uh, across the entire educational system in Inner Mongolia were subject to a barrage of patriotic training and propaganda. Here is just a, one screenshot from a local news report where you can see students at the Tongliao uh, Mongol kindergarten school learning the spirit of revolutionary heroes who had died uh, for the nation in the anti-Japanese resistance war uh, in order to deepen uh, their love for the nation. This is what the propaganda uh, uh, package uh, uh, asserted. Uh, in the paper, I also provide some analysis of a leaked internal training pamphlet that was used as the key text throughout this educational campaign. Uh, half of it is just filled with quotes from Xi Jinping, but the interesting pages uh, near the back uh, are quite explicit in warning local officials that they had fallen behind Xinjiang and Tibet uh, in educational language reform, you know, really kind of um, uh, using this, this notion that they were supposedly the the, the model uh, ethnic region, but they, you know, were really falling behind the, uh, the other regions. Uh, it also asserts quite clearly that unity is a presupposition and foundation of ethnic autonomy, and also argues that no ethnic region belongs to a single ethnic group. So it's not really the inner Mongolian autonomous region, it's just an autonomous region of the Chinese nation. Um, I also provide some coverage, um, uh, only because I've recently managed to, to download them of a series of new readers on Xi Jinping thought, uh, which were introduced across all of China in September, along with new regulations requiring all kindergartens like this one uh, to use Putonghua medium uh, instruction, which wasn't the case before. Um, the readers, and uh, I'm happy to send you uh, copies which show you where you can um, download them. They do make for a really uh, interesting uh, reading. Uh, there, there's four of them, depending on the level of students. Um, the, the, the middle picture here is uh, the first lesson and page of the junior elementary version of the reader, where, uh, as we can see, Xi Jinping uh, is front and center. And on this very first page, um, students learn, uh, quote, we all Chinese, we all deeply love our motherland. As grandpa Xi Jinping says, um, uh, love of one's motherland is the deepest and most enduring sentiment in the world, the source uh, for achieving individual virtue and the foundation for rendering meritorious service. The, the photo on the, 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 uh, the far left <coughs> is another screen grab from another lesson uh, on what I call Xi's uh, button theory, uh, where students learn, quote, uh, if you don't get the first button right in life, your uh, value system will be deviant and your social orientation crooked. So as we can see in these textbooks and the larger education system uh, uh, in Inner Mongolia, it's really uh, a push for uh, both um, cultural and ideological conformity. Uh, so those two elements uh, are simultaneously uh, at play. Um, the other element of the, the, the crackdown um, was uh, uh, was purge of local officials. 
So recent research um, has really demonstrated that she has been effective um, in using both uh, his anti-corruption campaign and personnel appointments to strengthen his personal authority and control over the party. Um, this uh, was also the case with uh, frontier regions like Inner Mongolia. Uh, take, for example, the current party secretary, uh, Shir Tai Fung. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand Shir Tai Fung. Uh, originally thought, well, he's, you know, he's described as a classmate of uh, Li Keqiang. Uh, so maybe, maybe he's not Xi's man, but uh, the more you dig into it, you can see that there are clear connections between Xi and Shir Tai Fung. Um, she had, um, sorry, Shir had served as Xi Jinping's deputy at the party school from 2007 to 2010. Uh, and then he was handpicked uh, to become party secretary uh, of the, uh, the uh, Ningxia Hui Autonomous Region in 2007, where um, uh, he was praised for uh, expunging overt symbols of Islam and retarding religious extremism and carrying out Xi's agenda for sinicizing uh, religion. And so another, you know, at that time, you know, there was real concerns that extremism was going to creep out of Xinjiang and Ningxia was seen as a really important battleground. And so sure got this really uh, important assignment. And um, uh, after, uh, after two years of success, he was then uh, tapped on the shoulder to go to Inner Mongolia. And I'm pretty convinced that was because she trusted him and she believed that he could go into the region and uh, implement his uh, nation building agenda and really try to, to tame the region and bring it under closer central party control. Um, but of course he was not um, the only one uh, uh, active there in terms of um, uh, purging personnel. Uh, within um, uh, months of the language protests, the Central Commission for Disciplinary Inspection launched uh, what it called a routine inspection of the region, uh, uh, resulting in the purging of uh, thousands of senior Inner Mongolian officials, uh, both Han and Mongol alike, uh, throughout uh, 2021. And so there's, there's lots of uh, evidence that you can bring to bear uh, looking at this uh, through, through a whole range of sectors. But one of the things you see is that, of course, the bar for loyalty appears to be a much higher for uh, Mongolian officials, particularly in the educational sphere. Um, take, for example, uh, Miss uh, Gao Wa, uh, uh, who is a celebrated uh, Mongolian uh, educator who actually won a state award as a hero of ethnic unity in 2007 uh, when she was a principal of the Tong, Tong Liao Mongol School. Um, and she hoped to increase its student enrollment by fivefold. Uh, she was eventually dismissed uh, from her role as a party secretary at the Tong Liao Education Department in late December, and then expelled from the party and convicted of corruption in June of this year. Similarly, uh, the very high profile uh, chairwoman of the, the autonomous region, uh, Bu Xiaolin, uh, who is uh, the granddaughter of the revolutionary and Mongolian hero, Ulanhu, was formally stood down um, in August uh, of this year, after being largely absent from public life for uh, over uh, 10 months. Now, there was no reason given for Boo's removal, but um, she was enough retirement age and possible that she'll be given some kind of ceremonial role. Uh, but it's quite clear that, uh, you know, she was clearly demoted, uh, either because she didn't implement this policy uh, uh, strongly enough or that somehow she was resisting it. And there she joins two uh, former Mongolian chairs of the region, uh, Yang Jing, uh, as well as Ba Tar, who have been dismissed uh, from public office under Xi Jinping. Um, so it's a real attempt here to remove particularly senior uh, Mongol party officials uh, who are deemed as uh, being disloyal to, uh, to Xi Jinping. Um, Bu Xiaolin was replaced by another Mongol official, uh, Wang Lisha, who had spent most of her career actually outside of the region, suggesting a, a kind of a concerted effort to weaken the links between uh, Mongolian officials in the autonomous region, uh, with, as I said, loyalty really emerging as the key determinant of promotion uh, uh, in Xi's China. Finally, the last element I look at is what I call the kind of weaponizing uh, of law. Uh, one of the reasons why Inner Mongolia was one of the last frontier regions to adopt 
Putonghua medium education is its really strong tradition of Mongolian medium uh, education, which was really underpinned by a strong legislative uh, foundation. Um, read, if you get a some chance, the 2005 regulation on the Mongolian written and spoken language work, which stipulates quite clearly that uh, written and spoken Mongolian should be the lingua franca of the region and that it, it is, quote, an important tool for exercising autonomy. A more recent uh, regulation, 2016 regulation on ethnic uh, education, also codifies really strong administrative as well as financial incentives to support uh, uh, Mongolian medium education. So it was quite clear uh, after the crackdown that these two laws could not stand. And in fact, um, in uh, January of 2021, the uh, Legislative Affairs uh, Committee of the, the, the National People's Congress made a ruling that these regulations and other regulations like that were in violation of Article 19 of the PRC Constitution, which calls for the promotion of Putonghua. Uh, so with the laws rendered uh, null and void, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the regional government uh, then drafted uh, two replacement laws uh, that um, it tabled recently for consultation. Um, and these uh, new draft regulations on uh, education and the promotion of Putonghua uh, will go into effect uh, on 1st of January 2020. Uh, and they mandate that schools adopt, uh, you know, the correct view of country, uh, history, nation, culture, and religion and promote uh, Putonghua as the foundation of the region's education system. Um, the, the regional government also enacted a new set uh, uh, of uh, regulations promoting national unity. It revised its uh, civilized behavior regulations, which are quite remarkable, actually govern just about every uh, facet of life, but also wrote into it um, Xi's uh, concept of forging a collective consciousness of the Chinese nation, and in theory uh, could lead to the punishment of anyone who was not demonstrating a firm footing of that theory. Uh, and then finally, uh, they also um, revised quite recently, so a lot of change, a lot of legislative change in a very short period of time, um, a, a change to uh, the um, extra point system on the Gaokao, uh, where, uh, where ethnic minorities used to receive extra points that are essentially going to be phased out uh, in a short period of time, uh, winding back these uh, minority preferential policies that is another key element of uh, Xi Jinping thought on nation building in the new era. So just, sorry, some, some concluding thoughts before I, um, before I, I, I finish up. Um, so the, the Chinese Communist Party has um, long used um, uh, a carrot and stick approach to ethnic governance. Um, under Xi Jinping, we've seen the party center turning to more coercive methods of control and homogenization as its tolerance for diversity wane. The emphasis is really on standardizing and normalizing Beijing's controls across the nation, while also creating a uniform set of ethnocultural norms in frontier regions like Inner Mongolia. As a result, uh, Mongolian identity, like those of other non-Han communities in China, is slowly but steadily being hollowed out. This sort of slow violence is cheaply structural and not really defined by any single event or policy action. Rather, it's it, particularly uh, outside of Xinjiang, it's really the kind of glacial drip and largely hidden altering of what it means to be a citizen of China and the norms that define that identity. Of course, ritualized performance, uh, performances of ethnic, uh, exotic ethnic otherness uh, remain uh, often through uh, fetishized costume, song and dance assemblages performed for the voyeuristic pleasure of visiting Han officials and foreign tourists. Meanwhile, in the main state, Mongols and other indigenous communities are being taught to dress, act, and speak in accordance with Xi Jinping thought in state schools. Yet, as I pointed out before, I think it's so important to, to, to keep in mind that Inner Mongolia is not Tibet, uh, nor is it Xinjiang. Regional variation remains, and so do local forms of resistance. Xi's uh, mandate for cultural nationalism and ethnic assimilation has been rolled out 
at different paces and under different local uh, circumstances. Uh, in Inner Mongolia, at least until recently, they did exercise a greater degree of autonomy uh, than those rest of regions where national security fears propelled a more heavy handed and securitized approach to stability maintenance and nation building. The party's methods in um, Inner Mongolia are, are far more subtle and less visible, uh, making them, I would argue, uh, more insidious to ethnic cultural diversity in China over the long term. And uh, I'll end there and um, uh, 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 welcome your comments and, and questions. Very near the end there, you made the point that um, maybe more soft um, policies are more effective. If, if I were a friend of Xi's, let's put it this way, I would caution that if you overplay your hand, it might, you know, dialectically uh, produce the, the opposite uh, of your intended goal. Do you think there's any, like, do you think that's a consideration at all or? I think the Chinese approach uh, to governance has always been quite methodical uh, with the long-term view, uh, but at the same time, there has been a kind of uh, frustration continually within the, the uh, Leninist, uh, with the Leninist uh, party system that, uh, because it's so complicated, um, so bureaucratic, um, you know, has different, um, different, um, uh, you know, often conflicting uh, interests built into it, that sometimes the system itself uh, becomes a bit gummed up and, and, and less effective. And so when um, the party state system perceives there to be a kind of existential threat of sorts, it often uh, resorts to this kind of campaign style governance that um, does lead to more extreme policy responses um, that um, can have devastating consequences. And I think that's what we saw in the case of Xinjiang. There was this real um, perception of, of, of fear that, that the, the region was spinning out of control, that you had all these uh, terror attacks that, um, that, you know, Xi at that time was, uh, you know, in the early years of his uh, rule, uh, didn't want to look uh, weak. Um, and, and so you have a pretty extreme policy response of the, you know, the, the rounding up and mass internment uh, of Uyghurs in these re-education camps. That's, that's quite an extreme policy response that um, I don't think is the party's preferred mechanism of, uh, of transforming its ethnic minority populations. Really, if you look at its approach to this issue, say over the last decade, 15 years, uh, the, the, more, the, the more I study it, the more I see kind of Xinjiang as the outlier, uh, the exception. Uh, the, 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 the preferred approach is, is a softer, uh, um, you know, less overtly coercive uh, uh, approach. I, I, I think the party state always prefers, if it can, to use carrots over sticks. Um, and um, in in the in the case of in the case of Inner Mongolia, you, you really you know, with the exception of that real intense crackdown um, in in September, um, late August, um, it's you know it's been coercive, but not like um, not uh, overtly coercive. It's uh, uh, you know it's subtle through the change to the legal system, uh, purging people, new appointments you know, a bit of ideological uh, campaign mixed in to, to kind of slowly uh, bring the region uh, to, to bear. Uh, uh, and, and so that, I, th I, think, I think that's the, the, the preferred mechanism. But, but of course, it also, you know, there's, there's regional dynamics at play. And here, I, you know, I haven't completely gotten my head around this, but there's, there's something about Inner Mongolia that, 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 that where Xi's control is quite weak. I actually think his control in all the frontier regions uh, when he came to power was quite weak. Um, the frontier regions have long been seen as breeding grounds of, you know, so the, the, the Tuan Pai 
this this party school faction uh and and so it, it you know it, it, when it comes to power none of these people are really she's men uh in those areas and so it's been a, a slow process of kind of um you know finding officials that he trusts um and, and removing others that he didn't uh trust and i think in particular inner mongolia appeared to be one that was really resisting uh more so than say certainly xinjiang was brought under uh strong control under chen chen guo uh and, and as was tibet where he was previously so yeah there's something different about it and i guess that's what what one of the things i'm trying to do with my um you know my current research is really look beyond look at the diversity of the way policy is implemented across china as it relates to ethnic issues and hoping to, 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 to look at the, the south of China. I mean, I, I haven't done anything yet. I mean, I'm looking at uh, Yunnan or Guangxi uh, to get a sense of what the dynamic is down there. I, um, you know, this seems classic, I'm a historian of colonialism, and if this seems kind of classic colonial behavior, you know, the, the British in, I, in Ireland, or um, uh, you know, there's plenty of examples of um, colonial powers promoting their language at the expense of an indigenous language, but it can be for reasons of just um, kind of chauvinism of, you know, just genuinely believing that their language is superior and their culture is superior, um, or it can be an explicit um, effort to um, suppress the native language because it's seen as a source of subversion. What's the balance, do you think, uh, between those two motivations for for Beijing here do they do they is there long-term plan for no one to speak any ethnic minorities um any ethnic minority languages because um that's a possible route to subversion or is it just they want everyone's first language to be Putonghua because um that's the the national language I, I think Isabel's a bit of both um as usually the case there's definitely chauvinism at play um a belief that you know Chinese cultural norms are superior as a long uh, held belief that you know uh, ethnic minority cultures and languages and um, religious traditions are somehow kind of backward uh, you know there's this, this trope going through that you know it, that you can't learn modern sciences in Uyghur or Mongolian you know uh, that if you really want to bring China into into modernity you, you know the, the vehicle has to be uh, Putonghua, but but you know, in fact, most colloquially, most people refer to it, you know, as Hanyu, you know, the Han language, you know, which yeah. kind of gives away the the fact that what we're talking about here is not the common speech; it's the the language of the majority. But there's also that concern uh, of subversion uh, that this language, uh, you know, because a lot of these uh, minority communities have diasporic populations uh, uh, across the border. So it can be used as a language of, um, of subversion and splitism, you know, with 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 Xinjiang and, and Uyghur, you've got concerns about, you know, Arabic and, you know, somehow that would feed into kind of the global jihadist uh, movement uh, that, uh, you know, we don't know what these people are saying on their online chats. And um, so, so I, th I think both those things uh, are, are certainly at play uh, and there's been a real uh, concerted um, effort to you know push the universalization of Putonghua under under Xi Jinping this, this was not a even though you know it is you, you know the it was in the constitution in article 19 <clears throat> I mean the constitution itself is contradictory because um uh I, I forget the uh, is it article 4 the article it talks about ethnic minority rights says they have the right to promote their their languages. Mm. Um, and, and so there's this indoor contradiction within the Chinese constitution. Um, and in the past, it, you know, there's an acceptance of that uh, minority languages were accepted and should be, be allowed to be used. Um, you know, that they had to be used in government and in and, 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 uh, legal uh, terms in autonomous regions, but we've seen a real real push to to universalize um uh, putonghua and really to kind of push out uh minority uh, language education um that um that that really it, it, you know we can really mark that with the arrival of xi jinping because it you know going back to that thing i was saying before the importance of ideology education this is seen as a 
uh, as a real key issue under Xi. Urbanization is a key policy. It has numerous elements to it. C clearly there's an economic component to it, but there's also a cultural component uh, to it. And there's, uh, you know, an environmental component to it. Uh, but for minority communities, whether it be Mongols or, or, or Tibetans, it's really about taking them off their land, um, bringing them into cities where they can, you know, receive state uh, education, uh, be incorporated into, into social uh, services, um, state surveillance, um, uh, and to kind of sever that connection uh, between the land, uh, the, the identity and the culture. Um, that's been happening uh, quite extensively uh, in Inner Mongolia. It's a, it's a long source of tension. I mean, you had uh, protest movements back in the 1930s uh, of, uh, about the destruction of, of, of the grasslands. It's intensified, particularly as you noted, uh, through uh, mining, you know, which is a massive uh, uh, revenue uh, generator for, for for Mongolia, which is is you know one of the, one of one of the uh, strongest economies uh, in, in in China, but a, a great source of uh, tension uh, between you know the the indigenous community and the the the, the, the Han kind of settler colonial uh, uh, machine. Um, just a, on a side note on Wolf Totem, um, a fascinating book, which I've uh, read, uh, actually been part of the, you've got to read the Chinese as well, because the, the, the Chinese has a, a, a long kind of appendix, um, which, which makes it fascinating uh, reading. Uh, in a kind of former life, I, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time um, in um, um, chat rooms amongst uh, Han extremists, uh, kind of think of them as kind of Han uh, nationalists um, that uh, inhabited parts of the, the cyber sphere. Um, and they were incensed by this, uh, this book, Wolf Told Them. Uh, the, the, you know, they, they argue that this, this was uh, an example of, uh, you know, the, the minority communities preparing for kind of genocide that, you know, they, they, they completely bought into the fact that, yeah, us Han are, were sheepish, you know, uh, the, they've got it up on us, uh, you know, they've got this martial tradition um, and what was needed to was to fight against this, this kind of new uh, generation of barbaric uh, nomadic invasion of China. Uh, and, and, and these people were completely opposed to many of the ethnic policies that then were critiqued by people like Ma Rong uh in huangang um there was a lot of resistance to these policies um uh amongst ordinary han um citizens who saw them as um, undermining um han privilege and power um and um you know so, 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 so in addition to being a kind of uh, intellectual move to rethink uh, and political move to rethink uh, uh, ethnic policies. There's a there's a deep kind of um, social element to it as well um, that we see any anywhere where you, you have tensions between majority and minority populations. I think you're completely right. I mean, I think we sometimes uh, because it's what we do. At least it's what I do. We look at. Uh, what's happening in uh, autonomous regions to minority communities, we lose sight that this is part of a kind of wider agenda of um, thought and behavior control. Uh, it's about, you know, it's, a, it's about shoring up the control uh, of uh, the, the party state system and ensuring she is at the very center of that um, and um, uh, stamping out any forms of uh, resistance, but also uh, transforming um, China in Xi's own image, um, regardless of whether you're a kind of, um, you know, a, a Han middle class person in Beijing or, a, a, you know, a, a peasant in Hubei or uh, a Uyghur in um, Kashgar. Um, of, of course, the, you know, the, 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 the requirement for change is, is a lot higher uh, in, uh, in those um, communities that are seen as having kind of 
low suture, you know, um, sort of low bio quality, uh, like, you know, uh, Uyghur farmers. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the desire for, for transformation is, is, is there and it's there across the board. Um, but, but we also have to appreciate the kind of the, the local dynamics as well. Um, uh, you know, the, there are common trends here, but, you know, she doesn't, you know, he's, he's not so powerful that he can control all of China. You know, with a click of a mouse, at least not yet. Um, and uh, the, there's tremendous kind of uh, regional variation uh, across China. And it's a, a vast country with an incredibly complex um, bureaucratic system. Thank you very much for this uh, super interesting talk and discussion, and also for, for staying up so late on our behalf.